This is the third of three optional modules in which I'm going to share a demo edit that I did of a student's work in a previous course. This module is optional, but it may help you to see how I approach editing an entire essay. It will help prepare you for the peer edits that you're going to do in a couple of weeks. So this paper was a, a biological paper, and what I'm going to have you do now is pause the video and read it over a couple of times so that you're familiar with it before uh, you restart the video and I'll lead you through how I would approach editing the paper. So now that you've read the paper a couple of times through, you can see it's about a experimental technique that you can use to actually control cell behavior. So it's a really cool technique. This is one is actually a little bit more technical than the, uh, the last two demo edits that I did. The author of this paper has actually done a really good job of trying to explain all of the technical material. So every time he introduced a technical term, he tried to explain uh, what that term was. So he's done a very good job. I think we can even go one step further in making this more understandable to a general audience who doesn't necessarily have a biology background. So especially if you weren't coming from biology, you may have found that you struggled a little bit to get through the, the technical parts of this because, again, it is a much more technical paper than, than the other edits that I showed you. So I think we can bring it one step further by removing a little bit of clutter uh, and setting the things up a little bit so we get the pertinent details when we're ready for them. I think we can take it one step further to make it even a little bit more understandable. And So that's what I'm going to focus on in this edit. Again, the author's done a really good job and I think we can just take it one step further to make it a little bit more understandable to a general audience. So I'm going to jump right in with the first paragraph. So uh, it has a great start to this paper. So it says traditional methods for controlling biological signals in cells are a sledgehammer. That's a wonderful picture right up front. front. And then the author says they are global, slow, and often nonspecific. I, we actually don't need the they are there, so I'm going to get rid of that. But then the global, slow, and nonspecific, the author starts with that and then kind of dovetails off of that and says that the authors of this new paper describe a technique to do local, fast, and targeted cell signaling. So that's a really nice contrast. The author set up a really nice um, introduction here. So I'm going to leave those first two sentences. I'm going to just change one thing in the second sentence. So the authors of this paper, that's a little bit general, the authors of this paper. Let's dive right in and say exactly what paper we're talking about and what specific authors in this first paragraph. So I said, uh, but in a 2009 uh, paper in Nature, so let's just, it is a Nature paper, so let's just, uh, we can give that detail. Uh, and then let's use the author's specific name, so Levs Kava et al. We'll just pop that up here. Let's Kava et al. Describe, and then I don't think we need there, I think a new technique, a, a new technique to generate local, fast, and targeted cell signaling in live cells. So that works really nicely. This idea of genetically altered to have light sensitive proteins, I think that's a little bit too much detail up front. So let's move that down. I'm going to get that detail in back later, but we don't need it quite yet in the introduction. We want to keep the introduction sort of big picture uh, so it's easy to, you know, to ease the reader into the story. So we get, um, we get this nice uh, technique to generate local, fast, and targeted cell signaling in live cells. Then we get a few extra details here that I'm also going to push down a little bit further into the paper. So they engineered a cellular perturbation system applicable to many signaling proteins. That cellular perturbation system is just kind of very jargony and sitting there. That's a little bit hard to digest early on. So I'm going to move that down. We'll get those. I, we'll get those details in back later. So all of those details I'm going to put back in in various spots in the second paragraph. Um, the idea that the signaling proteins have to be activated by a membrane, that's a very important detail for understanding this system. But I'm again going to move it down a little bit. We're not quite ready for that detail yet. I think once the system has been described, then that detail makes more sense. So I'm going to push that down. In the opening paragraph, what I'm going to add is I'm going to go to the very bottom of this paper, to the last sentence. The author has a great detail in the last sentence. So they show in movies that they effectively guided the direction, followed by the new lamella podium, the first reported control of cell movement in real time using light sensitive proteins. And when I got to that, I thought, well, aha, that's one of the biggest, you know, most significant pieces of this work. So don't 
put it at the ending. Let's put that right at the beginning. That's a nice use of the, of the dash by the author there, by the way. So we're going to put that at the beginning. The author also did a nice job of using a colon. So uh, that's great. And But let's get this idea right in here. This is one of the most significant things of the work. They actually controlled the cell movement of a cell. They controlled the movement of a cell. They were able to uh, force a cell to move in the direction they wanted using light-sensitive protein. So let's just say that right in the first paragraph. They reported the first control of cell movement in real time using light-sensitive proteins. And so we can kind of introduce that idea of the light-sensitive proteins being critical to this whole system without getting into too much detail yet. I'm going to get to that detail very quickly in the second paragraph. Again, all of these details here I'm going to incorporate into the second paragraph. So I'm going to skip them for now. This stuff is going to get put into this paragraph. Uh, starting with this genetically altered part. So uh, since we just named the researchers, I'm going to change this to the researchers. So the researchers, and let's, instead of saying um, built this membrane recruitment system, let's say genetically altered. So we'll start in with that genetically altered idea. Genetically altered cells to contain, and I'm going to say that genetically altered cells to contain these light sensitive proteins. Now again, this idea of the membrane recruitment system, I don't think we're ready for that concept yet. I'm going to put that further down into this paragraph. So we'll get that, but it's going to come later. So the researchers genetically altered cells to contain photosensitive proteins named phytochromes. And actually, I don't need the word photosensitive here because I just said in the end of the last paragraph, light sensitive proteins, which is the same thing as photosensitive, so we don't need to repeat that. And I'm also going to very quickly say what these proteins do, which is that they respond to light, so I don't need to use the word photosensitive. It would be repetitive here. So the researchers genetically altered cells to contain proteins named phytochromes. These proteins from plants detect red and near-infrared light. Okay, well, oh, they're from plants. These proteins are from plants. That's an important detail, but I can get that in right here by saying uh, these, the researchers genetically altered cells to contain plant proteins named phytochromes. And then we can just dive right into what they do, which detect red and near-infrared light. This uh, detail through the photoisomerization of a bound chromophore, I think that's quite jargony and technical and actually is not needed to understand this system, so I'm just going to cut that. I don't think we need that detail. So then um, let's jump into just exactly how it is that the phytochromes respond to red and near-infrared light. So that's what the author does in this next sentence. I'm just going to streamline this just slightly. So the idea is that the phytochromes, when they get uh, hit with red light, they bind to a particular protein called the PIF, the phytochrome interacting factor. When they ha are exposed to infrared light, they don't bind to that protein. So that's the idea, and I think we can say that just a little bit more quickly. So how about we just say, when exposed to red light, phytochromes, we don't need the asked here, phytochromes, we, the idea that it changes conformation I don't think is important. I think we can just say that it binds, phytochromes bind we don't need the directly bind to a phytochrome interacting factor. We can just say bind to phytochrome interacting factor, PIF. I'm going to uh, let the author keep in this one acronym because they do use this phytochrome interacting factor quite a bit in the article and it um, is a little bit long. So um, if that's the only acronym in the paper, we'll let that one acronym stay. So when exposed to red light, phytochromes bind to phytochrome interacting factor. And then when exposed, I'm going to use a semicolon here, when exposed to infrared light, it's just a little quicker to say when exposed to rather than under a state of, when exposed to infrared light, uh, they release PIF. Rather than saying they don't bind to PIF, I think it's a little more active to say they release PIF. I like that verb there. So that now tells you exactly how it is that phytochromes respond to red and near infrared light. So when exposed to red light, they bind this protein. When they are exposed to infrared life, light, they release this protein. All right, now we're going to get into the most important details of this system. So how does the system work? The scientists added a piece, uh, a, a domain, to the phytochrome protein that they've engineered so that it will stick to the cell membrane. So that's one key part. So the phytochromes are therefore going to be located at the cell membrane. So we need that uh, detail is important. The other detail that's important is that the scientists attached a signaling protein to this pr 
phytochrome interacting factor. So that's the whole idea. And you can attach any signaling protein you want there. The important detail is that it has to be a signaling protein that is activated by interactions with the membrane. So the system is going to bring that PIF into the membrane and bring that signaling protein into the membrane under certain conditions when exposed to red light and that's going to make the signaling, that's going to turn on the signaling protein. So that's the idea and I think the author's done a good job of describing it. I'm just going to tweak a few things here. Uh, since we already said the researchers, I might go back to using the actual researcher's name here just for variety. So uh, Levesque, oops, sorry, wrong one. So the, instead of the scientists, how about Levesque, Le, Levskava et al. added a membrane localization, uh, rather than part, I kind of prefer the word domain, uh, to the phytochrome and attached a signaling protein to the PIF. I don't think we need this to complete their system. I think those are just extra words so we can cut that. So that's the key. They, they change the phytochromes in this way. They change the PIF in this way. And the key to making, to understanding this whole thing is what you have to know is that you need to bring the signaling protein to the membrane. And the signaling protein has to be any signaling protein that's activated by interacting with the membrane. So remember, uh, I already got this idea in. This detail here about the candidate signaling protein has to be activated by interactions with the membrane. I'm now going to introduce that idea now that we understand that the phytochromes are sitting on the membrane. So I'm going to say the system works for any signaling proteins that are activated by interactions with the membrane. So I think we're ready for that detail now because now you see, oh, okay, because it's about bringing the signaling protein to the membrane. We weren't quite ready for that detail before. So I think now we've got all of those details in so we can cut all of that material that was originally in the first paragraph. I've now brought it into the second paragraph. We can, we can cut it because we've incorporated it. So now we know the system works for any signaling proteins that are activated by interactions with the membrane. Then we get this, a cell illuminated with infrared light will have inactive free-floating PIF attached signaling proteins. In other words, the signaling proteins will be floating around. They won't be on the membrane. Actually, I'm going to get rid of that whole sentence and just jump into, that's sort of the off state. I'd rather jump into the on state. So the author goes, had described the off state, and then they're going to describe the on state, and then they're going to describe the off state again at the end of this paragraph. In fact, I think we can just jump in and describe the on state and then describe the off state and we don't actually need that entire sentence. So we can just start right in on when the scientist points a red laser, I'm going to say at the cell membrane, at the uh, cell membrane, membrane bound phytochromes. So I'm going to get this picture across that these phytochromes are now sitting on the membrane. So I kind of like the idea of membrane bound phytochrome. So when the scientist points a red laser at the cell membrane, membrane bound, so we know that they're sitting on the membrane, phytochromes bind to PIF, thus bringing the signaling proteins, which of course are attached to PIF, we've just said that, the signaling proteins close to the membrane and increasing their activity. Since I just said that they need to be next to the membrane, membrane to ha have activity, it makes uh, sense to the reader that if you bring them into the membrane, it will increase their activity. We're kind of now ready for that. So when the scientist points a red laser at the cell membrane, membrane-bound phytochromes bind to PIF, thus bringing the signaling proteins close, we don't need that to stay, close to the membrane and increasing their activity. And we don't need to repeat of the signaling proteins, so thus increasing their activity. And then we get turning off the red laser, frees the proteins, and turns off the cellular signal. Notice how we don't need that whole sentence about, uh, that prior sentence about turning the signaling, uh, the cellular signal off. So I think now we've streamlined this a little bit, so it's a little bit easier for the reader to, to get through and a little bit easier to understand what's going on here. So the uh, author of this paper has done a nice job of organizing, by the way, because they put all the details about the system in the second paragraph. In the third paragraph, they put all the details about the experiments that were used to test the system. So we have a nice organization here. Again, for this third paragraph, I'm just going to streamline it just slightly. There's a few places where we can condense things so we get it across to the reader a little more quickly. So to demonstrate the feasibility of this new technique, they focused on the signaling proteins TM and intersectin. I actually think in this case we don't need the 
more details about what the, the precursors of the Rode GTPA. So that's getting a little bit too technical. And in fact, I don't think you need these details to understand this whole uh, section. So I'm just going to cut all of those and go right into to what TM and Intersectin do. They have critical roles in uh, organizing the actin skeleton. So we can just jump right into that. TM and Intersectin, uh, which help in the organization of, well, instead of in the organization of, which is a noun, let's say which help organize actin cytoskeleton during cell movement. So you notice that we didn't really need all those extra details, just the, knowing that these two proteins that we're going to be attaching to PIF, their job is to help organize the actin cytoskeleton during cell movement. That's sufficient. Next, the author said they performed three main experiments. Actually, I can get rid of this uh, three main experiments thing and just fold it into the first sentence just to be a little more concise here. So we're already talking about the experiments of the first sentence. So what if I just said, to demonstrate the fe feasibility of this new technique, they performed three main experiments focusing on the signaling proteins TM and intersectin. So I think we can fold that three main experiments into that first sentence, just kind of, again, cutting a little bit here and there, getting rid of clutter, making things a little bit more streamlined. Then uh, what I'm going to do it for the next two sentences, so the author then describes these three experiments. It's nicely organized. This is a very nice uh, logical organization. So they, the author goes to the first, the second, and the third experiment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to streamline things a little bit because, for example, in the next two sentences, the author in the first sentence describes what was done in the first experiment. And then in the second sentence here, they describe what was found in that first experiment. In fact, I think we can say it all in one sentence. We can just directly say what was found, and it sort of implied what was done. So try this. The first experiment, let's just go right into the not what they tested, but what it sh showed. The first experiment showed that membrane recruitment of a small part of intersectin and uh, intersectin and again I don't think we need this detail about regulating CTC42 that's not important here so the first experiment showed that membrane recruitment of a small part of intersectin that uh, transiently so membrane recruitment transiently increased local protein activity. That's what it's supposed to do. So that's kind of a proof of principle. And uh, we don't need to know that they showed images. We can just say again what they found. The first experiment showed that membrane recruitment translate increased local protein activity. And then again, we don't need the detail about CDC4 activity. So you notice we already got protein activity activity. So we can just get rid of that. Uh, and then we can say, and then uh, that this effect disappeared a few seconds after turning off the red laser. So now how does we get all the those two sentences, we condensed them into one. The first experiment showed that membrane recruitment of a small part of intersectin transiently increased local protein activity and that this effect disappeared a few seconds, need an A there, a few seconds after turning off the red laser. So we get it all in one. We can streamline the second, the description of the second experiment a little bit as well. So the second experiment, let's go right into what it showed. The second experiment showed that membrane recruitment of a small part of TM was sufficient to induce changes in the shape of these particular types of cells. And I'm just going to use that. I'm going to have a colon here. So I'm saying uh, exactly what was shown. I'm going to give the details of what was shown after the colon. So uh, when they illuminated the whole cell with red light for 20 minutes, now notice we get a lot of details about they counted the um, lamelli, lamellipodia. Uh, we can actually go right into what they found. So I'm going to just say when they illuminated the whole cell with red light for 20 minutes, almost 80% of cells made new lamelli, lamellipodia. So notice how we don't really lose anything by cutting out the they counted. It's implied that they counted them, right, if we know how many there were. So we can just go right into that. When they illuminated the whole cell with red light for 20 minutes, almost 80% of cells made new. Now we need to define this word here. So I'm going to put back in that definition of what's a lamellipodia. That's these little actin skeletal projections on the mobile edge of the cell. So we need that definition for those who don't know what that is. 
Now we don't need to repeat under a red light treatment, so we can delete that. So you know what, notice how much we can cut compared with a ten with ten percent. We don't need the A there with 10% of control populations. And I would say control cells here. It's okay to repeat the word cells. So when they illuminated the whole cell with red light for 20 minutes, almost 80% of cells made new. Lamellipodia, uh, here's the definition, compared with 10% of control cells. And I think that's sufficient. And then we can jump right into this last thought. So they said to make things even more interesting, I think we can streamline this just slightly by saying even more interesting. In a third experiment, they pointed a red laser dot on the edge of one cell and gradually moved it outward, slowly extending this red targeted region from the cell body. I think that's a really nice description. Notice the good verbs there. I'm going to leave that as is. They show in movies that they effectively guided the direction uh, followed by the new lamellopodium. And I've already moved this detail up. I'm going to keep this colon here, though. Uh, I'm sorry, dash here. And say, thus controlling thus controlling the movement of the cell. So kind of summarizing exactly what's going on here. A little bit repeating what we said at the beginning, but this is uh, giving more details about exactly how they're controlling the movement of the cell. And then that's not quite enough to end on. So what I'm going to have the author add here is add uh, short, we need a short conclusion here. Um, add a short conclusion. And what that conclusion should say is what are other potential applications of this research. So I'm going to go back to the author here and say in the revision, I'd like to know, I, I need kind of a concluding paragraph that gives me the wider implications of this work. So I know now that I can control the movement of a cell now with a red laser. What other potential applications does this system have? I imagine there is a wide variety of potential applications that are pretty important here. So we need a nice conclusion that uh, says exactly what are those other potential applications. It might be just one or two sentences as a fourth paragraph here. So I'm going to go back to the author and ask them to add that in. Say what are the other bigger, you know, bigger picture implications of this work? How else might we be able to apply this? What other types of cell behavior might we be able to control now that we have this system? Uh, other than that, I think the uh, paper is now reading really well. We've streamlined it a little bit, made it a little bit easier to follow the technical details. The organization was already pretty good. I just moved a few of the technical details out of that first paragraph uh, so that the first paragraph wasn't too intimidating for the reader. And now I think it's reading really well. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.